Hi guys, we're going to talk about suicide. Um, this is chapter 25. We're not going to really touch a lot on non-suicidal or self-injury. The focus with this chapter is really going to be that suicide, suicidal ideation, um, completed suicides, um, just kind of stemming all around that. So let's just get started here. Don't grieve for me, for now I am free. I'm following the path that God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned away and left it all. Tasks left undone must stay that way. I found true peace at the close of day. If parting now has left a void, then fill it with remembered joy. Perhaps the time seemed all too brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your heart and remember me. God wants me now. He set me free. So that was just a suicide note that I found, um, not me personally, that I found online, um, just to try to get you in the mindset of that person. Um, remembering that suicide doesn't end the pain, usually it just passes it on to someone else. And if you've ever personally experienced someone close to you or someone that you know commit suicide and then you have still that connection with that family, you can really, really see how that pain really just shifts from that person um, who has now moved on and has moved that pain onto those that are still living. Suicide is devastating. It is that intentional act of killing oneself by any means. Human life ends every 13 minutes as the result of suicide. Clients that are suicidal can be ambivalent about death and intervening can make a big difference. So if we know that they're really like talking about death, um, they're Considering death, if we can intervene quickly, it can really make that big difference. Clients that contemplate suicide believe that the act is to end the problem, and they have very little concern about the aftermath or the ramifications to those that are left behind. Suicidal ideation is thinking about personal death, including the wish to be dead, considering methods of accomplishing death, and formulating a plan. Clients can have feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, and inner pain. Completed suicide is one in which self-injury acts committed by an individual results in death. And then non-suicidal self-injury um, is there to self-injury directed to the surface of the body. Um, to try to induce relief from the negative feelings. So those of you that may know, I know several patients or I've had several patients that have cut. Um, they're cutting their legs, they're cutting their wrists. And what they're really doing is just cutting that surface body to help relieve. Um, that, that's painful and it's taking their mind off of that negative pain um, that's going on into their in their minds. Um, hopefully to achieve that positive state of mind. So as far as epidemiology, it's the 10th leading cause of death, the second leading cause of death for the 10 to 34 year olds, fourth in 35 to 54 year olds, and eighth in 55 to 64 year olds. In 2014, attempted suicide or suicidal ideation led to approximately 470,000 emergency department visits. It's also important to remember that suicide rates may be double or triple because those reported um, may have been accidents, homicides, um, or deaths ruled as undetermined, um, and they actually are suicides. Suicide rates among active duty service members has surpassed those of civilians and suicide rates among veterans is increasing more rapidly than that of the general population. And I'm sure you guys have heard some commercials about NAMI um, as we've gone through this pandemic. It's the National Alliance for Mental Illness. 
And this is, um, I just pulled this right off of their website. Um, so it has a few different um, causes of death or leading causes of death. Uh, but you can see there, 46% of people who die by suicide were diagnosed by a mental health condition. So you can see how relevant having a mental health condition is that leads to that suicide. 90% of people who die by suicide have shown symptoms of mental health conditions. Um, it gets into your lesbians, gay, bisexual youth, um, so your LGBTQT group four times more likely than our straight youth. 78% um, of people who die by suicide are male. Transgender adults are nearly 12 times more likely. Um, so lots and lots of statistics here, just so you can get a visual um, how, how suicide really is impacting our communities, impacting our nation, um, really impacting the world. So what are some of the risk factors um, for suicide? 90% of people that have completed suicides usually have a psychiatric disorder, which we saw on that previous slide. Depression is the diagnosis most commonly associated with suicide. Anorexia, nervosa, PTSD, and schizophrenia are also very risky fact factors. Substance use out disorder um, increase the risk of suicide by decreasing those inhibitors and increasing the aggressiveness and impairing judgment. Male gender, we've talked about um, increasing age is a risk factor. Race, it says 85 to 90% are Caucasian. That's the highest percentage of all completed suicides. Religion, um, Protestant, sorry, Protestants and Jews have higher rates than Roman Catholics. Marriage um, is a risk factor. Being married, especially with children, lowers that risk. But divorced men are more likely than divorced women to kill themselves. Professionals are at a high, higher risk with loss of employment. Increased risk in construction workers um, is the recent one. And then physical health, those with chronic illness are definitely at increased risk. Some biological factors, um, we know that it could run in the family. They have a lowered SKA2 gene, um, which lowers the individuals with that suicidal ideation. Low serotonin levels are related to depressed mood and completed suicide autopsies revealed that a lot of times these levels of serotonin in the brainstem have really been significantly lowered. Some of the psychosocial factors, um, Freud theorized that suicide resulted from aggression turned inward. Menninger added to Freud's work describing three aspects of suicidal hostility, meaning the wish to kill, so some type of revenge, the wish to be killed because of guilt, and the wish to die because of hopelessness. Beck identified central emotional factors underlying suicide intent um, is hopelessness. Cognitive styles contribute to higher risks, are rigid, all or nothing thinking, the inability to see different options, and perfectionism. And we've talked about that diathesis stress model. It focuses on that lethal combination of suicide fantasies accompanied by a loss. So that could be stress. And then copycat suicides, I'm sure you all are familiar with. Um, those are those maybe adolescents that are at high risk due to immature prefrontal cortex, which is the portion of the brain that involves judgment and impulse control. So they hear about these suicides, um, especially the media, they make such a big deal about them. Um, and then those adolescents see all of that tension sinking um, and unfortunately, that's where those copycat suicides kind of come into play. And this is just a slide with that diathesis stress model, um, right? The stressor may be the psychiatric disorder, the crisis. They have this suicidal ideation in mind. And then the stress part comes in, um, the hopelessness, the impulsivity, the low serotonin, and then that makes that suicidal act. 
So we've hit a little bit on LGBT. Um, youth bullying is on the rise, especially among this group. Um, this specific group of youth report really high rates of suicide because of online bullying, name calling, verbal and physical harassment. Um, white LGB and Hispanic bisexual females are typically more bullied. Um, black LGB's um, vulnerability to bullying is about the same as a heterosexual youth. And then sexual minority youths were more likely to report suicidal um, ideation. Some cultural factors include religious beliefs, family values, sexual orientation, gender identity, bullying, and attitude towards death. When we think about our African Americans, um, men are greater than women with our um, suicidal completion. Uh, most of the time, African American include religion and that role of the extended family. Both can provide a very strong support system to hopefully decrease those suicidal tendencies. With our Hispanic Americans, um, this might include our Roman Catholic religion um, and the, again, the role of the extended family. And then our Asian Americans, um, adherence to religion that tends to emphasize interdependence between the individual and society. Self-destruction within these Asian Americans is seen as disrespectful to the group or the self. So I do know like some of um, my patients that have been Asian Americans that have attempted suicide um, and weren't successful with it, they really get shunned from their families because that self-destruction is considered very disrespectful. So unfortunately, our society um, that once banded together is just becoming more isolated, right? We're texting instead of talking. Um, people drive to work alone. Neighbors frequently don't know each other. And so isolation really sets the stage for despair. Assisted suicide, um, as far as within the United States, individual states can allow, regulate, or prohib prohibit the assisted suicide. But the Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, those are very legal countries that assisted suicide can happen. As far as suicidal bombings, um, this is an honor to die in defense of their faith. When we talk about the clinical picture, suicide attempts um, is that first box there. A history of suicide attempts increases the probability of actually completing the suicide. So on average, about 56.4 of reported attempts received adequate mental health treatment. So think about the other 43.6%, uh, right? If they don't receive that adequate mental health, those are the ones that if they continue to attempt, um, it's going to it's going to unfortunately be completed at some point. Suicide behavior disorder um, was proposed as a new disorder for the DSM-5, and these are ways to better identify and track those individuals. Have they had an attempt within the last 24 months? Was the attempt initiated in some type of a delirium or confusion state of mind? Or was the attempt not undertaken for a religious or political objective? Some of the suicide warning signs, when we hear about them talk, they, these patients are very burdened. They are experiencing unbearable pain. They talk about killing themselves. They have no reason to live they may feel very trapped. Their mood is depressed. They have loss of interest. They may be irritable, rage, anxious. And some of the behaviors noted may include increased use of alcohol or drugs, acting reckless. They may withdraw from activities, isolate themselves from family and friends, and they either sleep a lot, so too much or very, very little. So let's apply our nursing process. We always start with assessment. Um, assessment is gonna be essential to establishing that therapeutic relationship. 
So we're going to look for verbal and nonverbal cues. Um, we have to ask patients if they're considering suicide. Comments or signals from clients that are contemplating suicide can be overt or direct messages or covert or indirect messages. So those overt are open messages. Some examples may include, I can't take it anymore. I wish I were dead, right? Very open messages about it. Covert statements can be very concealed. Um, so that might include, it's okay now, soon everything will be fine. Things never work out, it won't be a problem much longer, right? We're concealing um, those indirect messages. People contemplating suicide are relieved to talk to someone about their despair and their loneliness. Ask about suicidal thoughts does not give that person the idea to commit suicide. Some of the nonverbal cues that we can look at um, are showing a sudden brightening of mood. Individuals may be at a greater risk if their mood lifts because they have the energy and the um, to act on their plan. If they're giving away possessions, writing letters, organizing their finances, those would all be nonverbal cues that um, it may be on the horizon and we need to be very aware. Lethal, lethality of suicide plan. There are three main elements to consider lethality. Is there a specific plan with details? How lethal is the proposed method? And is there access to the planned method? So based on the lethality of a method, you can classify the method as high or low, also referred to as hard or soft. Hard methods include using a gun, jumping off of high places, hanging, or soft methods might include cutting their wrists, inhaling natural gas, or maybe even ingesting pills. Remember, we always talk about self-assessment. Um, health professionals may fear or may experience fear, grief, anger, even puzzlement, um, and they may even condemn those suicidal feelings or intent. So we have to determine as nurses, how do we feel about suicide? Um, we have to also be able to um, ask those very uncomfortable questions about suicide and suicidal ideation. So make sure you're self-assessing um, if you ever are experiencing somebody um, with suicidal ideation or one that has committed, um, that has gone through, that completed that suicide. Patient-centered care. Um, nursing care, care consists of primary, secondary, and tertiary interventions. When we think about our primary interventions, these are gonna focus on suicide prevention. We're gonna educate, we're gonna screen to try to identify those at risk. Secondary is focusing on those individuals that have an acute suicidal crisis. And this is where those precautions, those are gonna be implemented. As far as tertiary, the focus is providing support and assistance to survivors of um, clients who have completed that suicide. Some of the suicide precautions that we can consider are our one-on-ones. Um, that's going to be around the clock. We're going to make sure we're really documenting um, what is their patient's location, what is their mood, what are the statements they're saying, what is their behavior, and really dependent on the facility protocol, we could be documenting every 15 minutes. We're going to search those belongings. This has to be done in the presence of the client. And then we're going to need to determine um, what is safe for them to keep in their personal belongings and what do we need to maybe lock up. Um, we're going to give them plastic eating utensils. We're going to count the utensils when they're brought into the room. And then we're going to count them when they come out of the room to make sure we have everything accounted for. We're not going to assign these patients um, to a private room. Um, and we're gonna keep those doors open at all times. We wanna ensure that all meds are swallowed. Um, clients will try to hoard medication until they know they have enough to attempt that suicide. 
uh, medication reconciliation. Um, if there are any meds at home that they're taking, are they going to interact with any new prescriptions we might be giving them? And then we really want to monitor those visitors and what items are they bringing into the room. So essentially, we're going to be searching those belongings as well. So this is just a nice little um, suicidal precaution, kind of gives that visual. Um, you can see um, the window, right, and making sure the windows lock, break proof glass or mirrors. Um, the cords with either the phone, extension cords, or stethoscope, making sure none of those are in there. No belts, matches, cigarettes, sharps, or razors. And then as far as patient care, we're going to frequently observe them, um, right? That one-to-one -one will be a continuous one-to-one. -one. We're communicating, we're developing that therapeutic relationship. Um, we may have a written behavioral contract with that patient if they are in danger of themselves, our safety for themselves or others, we may have to do some restraints, medications, um, and then again, monitoring those um, visitors and the belongings that are coming in. As far as environmental safety guidelines, um, we want to just try to minimize suicidal behaviors on that psych unit. Um, so again, use and count plastic utensils, no private rooms, doors open. Um, it's jump proof, it's hang proof, um, especially in the bathrooms. Um, we're going to lock doors to any non-patient areas in case they try to escape. We're going to monitor or remove any potential harmful gifts. That's those things that are being brought in by our visitors. Um, in the patient's presence, again, we want to assess their belongings and search for any harmful objects. And then just make sure that the patient's not bringing or leaving any harmful objects that they can um, um, conceal or get to later. So some of the medications that you may see with this patient population are our antidepressants or our SSRIs. Again, remembering that these can take one to three weeks for a therapeutic effect. Um, our benzos, we're going to observe for CNS depression um, and remembering that caffeine can interfere with our desired effects. Lithium, making sure we're increasing our fluid, we're maintaining a healthy diet and exercise if we um, prescribe that. And second generation antipsychotics. Um, these are usually preferred over the first generation uh, because of those less adverse reactions. And that concludes chapter 25 on our suicidal chapter. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we can chat about it in class. Thanks guys.